Okay, um, let's start. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's workshop at Product School, a framework for well-defined integration requirements with Prismatic. For those who are not familiar with Product School, we are the global leader in product training and have the largest product community in the world. We host up to four free events every week and uh, as well the largest product conference called Product Comfort Times per year. If you want more information, please visit productschool.com. At Product School, we help product managers excel in their careers from landing their first PM job to getting promoted. We do this with four different certifications. Our product manager certifications help professionals break into the world of product management. Get your first product management job, build the skills you need to stand out, get hired and succeed in your first 90 days and beyond. Our artificial intelligence product certification is designed to empower you and help up level you up in an SINI product manager. Learn to build cutting edge AI products, understand AI fundamentals, optimize performance using AI, and much more. Our product leader certification gets you to your next promotion. Elevate your product management career by acquiring advanced product strategy skills, mastering team management, and making impactful data-driven decisions. And finally, our product marketing manager certification will equip you with a holistic set of skills to bring products to market successfully. Now on to some of the housekeeping. To get, mo to get most of the, of the workshop, participate as much as you can. Do not be shy. Ask any questions you might have. We love to hear from you. So please use the chat to ask anything you have. And we'll also be posting some polls so that you can answer. Um, the, the disclaimer is that this event will be recorded. Well, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Jake Hagel, Solutions Engineer Manager at Prismatic, who will be our workshop facilitator today. Jake, the stage is yours. Jake, I think I'm not hearing you. No, I think I think we're not. No, we don't have any. Try one time. How about now? Well, yes. Thank you, Jake. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm super excited to be here. And I think let's just go ahead and dive right into it. So I'm going to share my screen. And we'll start walking through a presentation that I put together today. So for today, um, we're going to go through a framework for well-defined integration requirements. And just as a little bit of background about me first, um, I'm Jake Hagel. I lead our solution engineering team here at Prismatic. And uh, before that, I was a software engineer, spent several years building integrations and feeling a lot of the pain of it. Um, built out a, a few hundred integrations for a few thousand customers. And then once I started here at Prismatic, um, I've been helping SaaS companies on their journey to evaluating new ways to build and deploy their integrations across their customers. So like Tata said, I want this workshop to be interactive. Um, don't be shy about asking questions. It looks like we're getting some interaction in the chat already. Um, great, to, great to meet everybody. Glad to see some messages coming through. So feel free to throw questions in as we go through. Um, we'll do a Q&A at the end as well. So if there are some you know, larger questions that we need to dig into then, um, we absolutely can. But I think for today, um, we're going to walk through an integration scenario. And we could pretend that I'm a team member of Acme SaaS. And we're going to go through what it looks like to define and build uh, an integration. So just kind of stepping through this, um, I want to kick it off with a quick poll. And I think it did just get posted here in the chat. So feel free to feel free to respond. Would love to know how many employees your companies have, um, just so I can you know make a bit more of a informed decision on sort of the the talking points that we're going to go through. In general, it will apply across all the different software companies, but um, it might be that 
you know, the smaller, smaller teams, one person's wearing a lot more hats than the other. So um, just keep that in mind as you're going through. Feel free to drop info in the chat too, if you want to uh, just share some of your answers there as well. Give it just a second here while people are responding to the poll. And then it looks like um, it looks like quite a few are in the 100 to 500 range. We've got you know a fair amount that are underneath that as well. Not too many above, so pretty good distribution. And I think that's generally where we see a lot of companies um, really starting to focus in on integration. So great to hear that you know we're all in the right place. So let's see. I think before we get too deep into how you define an integration strategy and all of the, the scenarios that we're going to walk through in this workshop, I want to take just a few minutes to sort of zoom out and talk about um, why integrations are important in the first place and, and what it means to have a uh, integration strategy. It looks like there's actually a question about the um, spec template. So there is a link down at the bottom, if you scroll down a little bit below uh, the presentation, the template should be in there. Otherwise, I think maybe Tata could add it to the chat as well. But definitely, if you don't have it, um, feel free to pull it down. Let's see. Oh, it looks like there might be some issues getting access. Um, Yep, it looks like it's actually hosted in a Google Doc. So people might be having trouble getting um, access. Laura, do you know if there's another one that we could share in the chat? All right, so I think while we get that figured out, Laura is going to send a link. Um, let's talk a little bit about the ideas of integrations first. So what we found, you know, going and talking to thousands of these software companies, um, integrations are just a really important thing to customers. If you think about your own company, think about all of the software tools that you use internally. Um, it ends up being, you know, an average mid-market company, which it sounds like, you know, there's a pretty good distribution of you here using around 130 software tools and for those tools to really be valuable for those tools to work in your workflows there's become an expectation that the software is able to talk to each other and that really adds so much value to your customers by you know letting them bring their data into your system right away getting you know the the workflow that they might operate in with the other tools in their tech stack being fully integrated so you don't have to duplicate work or look in multiple apps to get a whole picture of what's happening. We also hear from so many software companies that their customers are coming to those sales conversations saying, do you integrate with some CRM or some other tool that our, our, our team uses? Because if you don't, this is a non-starter for us. So it really becomes such a, a key part in the way customers evaluate technology and, and their expectations around it. So what that really means for software companies is you have to provide integrations. And that's really not the primary focus of most software companies, right? You're, you're there building your product and trying to solve a particular problem for your customers. And to be honest, integrations have always really been treated as a secondary thing or an afterthought. Um, rather than like a, a core competency at these software companies. But hopefully through this, uh, this workshop today, I can kind of convince you that it's not only that integrations are a necessary evil, but maybe they're not actually evil. Maybe it's something that your users really care about and add so much value to your application. So we'll dig into it as we go, but um, just wanted to set kind of that high level of where this is important and why we're even talking about integrations today. So 
I guess we can all agree that, you know, integrations are a thing our customers want. It's something that we as the software companies are now being obligated to provide to our customers. So how do you do that? How do you build integrations and not just a handful, but build these integrations that scale across all of your customers that don't burden your developer team and exhaust all of those resources? Because honestly, development time and uh, development resources are so limited that software development is almost an exercise in deciding what not to do. So hopefully as we go through this, you can see the strategy is really an attempt to give you a framework to outline your integrations, build them, make them maintainable and scale it across your organization, whether there's a handful of you or you know several hundred people in your, in your business. So let's do another quick poll. I would love to understand what percentage of the integrations that are being developed by your team are coming from customer requests or being sent over from your sales team versus ones that are being proactively um, planned around by your product team or internal initiatives. We'll just let a couple of these polls start to come in. And it looks like um, we've got a few already. Quite a, quite a few are in the 76 to 100% range. Um, almost all of your integration roadmap is driven by customer requests. It sounds like there's also a pretty good mix of 50 to 75%. And I think where I've seen so many software companies um, answer that question is really towards that tail end of, you know, 50% or greater are being driven by customer requests. And there's a couple of key kind of points to focus in on as you're thinking about responding to these customer requests. A lot of times customers say, hey, we're not going to sign with you. Or we're not going to buy your product unless that integration exists. And that becomes a very um, slippery slope of getting your team hyper-focused on one very specific use case of connecting your product to whatever the other product your customer uses for their very specific needs. And what that ends up looking like is, and this isn't always the case, but often when you're very focused on reacting to customer requests and having a proactive planned strategy around this is that you often fall into a services model where you're building an integration specifically for one customer to solve a, a very particular problem. And this is something that I really experienced firsthand where we would develop an integration for a customer to, to get them on board, to get them to start using our product. And it would be a few months later, the next customer would come along and they would need almost the same integration. But there's always nuances between customer to customer, whether it's something like their Salesforce that you're integrating to has custom fields and custom objects you need to support, or even something more simple like which Slack channel should you send notifications to? It's always different customer to customer. And if you take that sort of reactive view and, and keep it very, very narrowly focused, it becomes very unmanageable where you end up duplicating a lot of work. And really what I think the, the goal here is to walk through how you can productize your integrations. And that's a term we use a lot at Prismatic, talking about productized integrations. But just to expand on that a, a little bit more, you can think of that as building integrations the same way that you build your product. Make it work not just for the first customer or the first handful of customers, but build it in a way that it's scalable and repeatable. Build it one time, configure and deploy it across many different customers and give them the tools to be able to drive a lot of the functionality so it fits into each one of their unique environments. What you find is all of the integrations, while on the surface feel so specific and so bespoke, there's so much commonality between the true problem that they're solving for your users.
So I guess that kind of takes us on to what is the point of this integration spec template that we're going to walk through. And it's really meant to give you a structured framework to developing productized integrations that your team's easily able to develop because they know all of the necessary pieces up front. They know where to reach out for questions or, or people to reach out to, to identify any of the blockers or risks that might come up and then be able to ensure that there's alignment all the way down from ideation when you're talking to your customers and identifying what needs to happen to the actual developer who's doing the work hands-on keyboard um, to then the delivery team of how you're rolling that integration out and what it's solving for your customers. So we're going to use a, a scenario today um, to go through a Slack integration. As I mentioned earlier, I'm going to pretend to be uh, someone from a fake software company called Acme SaaS. And you can imagine Acme SaaS is a task management solution for go-to-market teams. So, you know, as your, your reps are out there talking to customers, talking to prospects, they're creating tasks that need to be tracked. And our product team at Acme SaaS has decided that we need to launch a new integration initiative to drive more adoption of our tool. People find a lot of value in our tool, but because it's outside of so many of their main workflows, it's hard to get users to integrate that additional tool into their day-to-day -day work. Um, so the idea is we're going to build a Slack integration. We've heard from customers, we've heard from users or uh, our sales team that they really want support for these kinds of tasks in the messaging tools that they live in. Be able to receive notifications and maybe even react to them all without having to get out of the context of where they're working. So that's kind of the, the overall scenario that we're going to use. Build a productized Slack integration to let our customers start receiving notifications that are actionable where they're spending their time. And the outcome of that should be drive more adoption of the Acme SaaS tool to our users. So let's actually talk through what it means uh, as far as getting started with this framework. And it's broken up into a couple of sections that are sort of the high level big picture. We'll double click a little bit deeper into the, the requirements or the user stories that are relevant to the problem we're trying to solve. And then the last bit is what are all the technical details that need to exist for your team, for your developers to hit the ground running. So let's start with really the, the very highest level. What's the purpose of this integration? Why are we building it in the first place? And what do we need to identify before we can even decide if this is something we want to do? And looking at that Slack scenario, you can imagine, you know, we're, we're talking about the big picture. There's a, a need for our customers that this integration should be solving for. In this case, we're talking about driving more adoption by providing actionable notifications to our users where they're actually working. We might have email notifications today, but I think I'm probably not the only one who feels inundated with uh, emails and, and notifications in my inbox. Sometimes it's just too much noise to see the actionable things that um, I might care about day to day. So rather than uh, just relying on that, we're going to walk through defining the Slack in integration. We're going to talk about how this integration is going to enable our users to subscribe to the events in Acme SaaS that they care about, get those task notifications directly in their Slack workspace, and even handle modifying statuses or reassigning those um, directly from Slack without ever having to go log into our application. And most of that you can think of as sort of the big picture from there. When does this need to happen? And is there a, a larger initiative that's at play? These are the relevant details for the rest of the team who might not see sort of the bigger picture of how your product is fitting into the world of your users. They might just be, you know, really focused on their specific area of the problem. 
And integrations are kind of an interesting piece where they touch the majority of an, a software organization in different ways. Different problems show up for different uh, personas within your, within your team. And so having just a, a roadmap or a compass to point to to say, these are the things that we are doing and the reasons why. So we're going to talk about the Slack one. We are planning an integration marketplace initiative that's going to launch in Q1 of 2025 to drive that um, adoption. We're going to start with the Slack integration. There might be more in the future, but that's the one that we're going to tackle first because we've identified that's what our customers care about. So what does that mean? We know Slack is the integration we want to build and we know when we need to build it. What needs to happen before someone can even sit down and start to develop that? And this framework is really intended to help you standardize those details you need up front. So there isn't a lot of back and forth. Um, your developers having to context switch because you know we missed identifying maybe access to a particular sandbox or um, any changes that have to happen to your application before you can even integrate it. Um, in this particular example, what we're going to what we're going to look at is in Acme SaaS to be able to support sending notifications to our customer Slack channels. They need to be able to set up those notifications in our app. So right now we've identified that there needs to be an API surface that handles setting up these notification destinations. That's something that we haven't implemented before. And that work's going to need to be completed before our developers can start to create this integration. So identify those changes up front that could become major bottlenecks uh, before you know, you even start work. And then from there, let's identify, are there certain sandboxes we need access to? It's always one of the big challenges with building integrations. How do I connect to the system? How does my developer test? Are there credentials that we can use? Having a standardized way to identify that immediately, call out risk if there's no access to sandboxes and get those details to your developers so they don't have to hunt them down it's going to save you so much time in the long run. Once you've identified the very highest level of how you're going to connect, any changes that need to happen, then it's time to really dive into uh, both of the systems. That means starting to talk to customers, starting to talk to the power users of your system, talk to the, the product team that has this larger vision of how your integrations are gonna fit into uh, the larger picture of solving this need for your customers. By the time it gets to your developers, they're very far removed from your users. And so it's not always the easiest to translate the needs and um, the, the specific challenges that these users might have or even understand the way that their processes and workflows work to make this integration truly valuable and, and fit that so well if you don't have that direct line to the people that are using your tool and using the other systems. So being able to identify that and get your developers resources up front so that when they do have those questions about how things should work, there isn't a, a need to go hunt down new people and get them up to speed on this. They're already involved and they have that high level viewpoint. So for this particular example, because we are looking at it from the lens of, uh, you know, having customer requests for these message notification integrations, but not a specific requirement from one particular customer, our product team is the one who's done a lot of the research to identify can we even support this in Slack? They pulled in some of the SMEs, the, the subject matter experts of our customers that use our tool to understand how it works into their workflow. And once they've gathered that information, they're able to then put those subject matter experts and their contact information and the, the details they provided in front of your team so that anybody throughout the chain has that access and understands 
who to go to when they're trying to identify, you know, that user experience or maybe how this should work in the event of some edge case that wasn't considered up front. The next is distilling so much of that information as you talk to those users, as you talk to those subject matter experts, taking that information and distilling it down into the bigger picture of how this particular integration is going to be used by your users and how it's going to fit into their day-to-day -day workflow and really what it's going to do as far as solving those challenges they might have. So we'll look at the Slack uh, example where the user stories, um, the primary one is get the users actionable events in the place that they work in their Slack workspace so that when tasks are being created or assigned or due dates are being announced within Acme SaaS, we can surface those up to users in their Slack where they're interacting with their customers that those tasks are dependent on in real time. They don't have to go log into their email and follow a link to get into your application, find that task in there and, and work with it. It's just readily available to them. Reduce that friction of getting them using your tool. So once that notification is there, we want the user to be able to interact with it. Maybe they need to update statuses or reassign tasks to other members of the team. Well, all of those team members are already in Slack. Let's just leverage the abilities there to assign users or um, you know, handle those tasks. A big part of that is the administrator at the company is going to need to set up the connection between your system and uh, the, the customer Slack workspace. There's going to need to be a place to configure notifications by that administrator to say, hey, this is the channel that we should get all these notifications to. Or maybe some customers want direct messages rather than one shared channel that all of the notifications end up in. Being able to define that in your application as a configurable piece is going to let users really quickly set this up. And if you think back to that idea of productizing, it is going to give them the, uh, the ability to customize this integration to fit their needs, fit the way that they work, whether it is you know, direct messages because maybe some of those tasks have sensitive information that shouldn't be shared broadly, or it is just dialing in to that one channel and getting a, a trail of these upcoming tasks for all of your team members to take action on. So really define that high level objective. What is this trying to do beyond the, the technical details? It's always easy to fall into those technical details of when an action happens in our system, it should send a message to a Slack channel by a certain ID. And those are, those are special or important details, but your developer needs to understand what is the thing that we're solving and, and how is this going to fit into that customer's world? So we've got another poll here. I am interested in hearing from the audience. How do you feel, you know, looking at the gathering of requirements that we've gone through so far, that overall kind of top level idea. Do you feel like that's an area that your team has implemented a process for? As your developers are getting these requirements, do they know who to reach out to, what those, um, what those necessary uh, credentials or sandboxes might be? Or do you think there's still areas where there is friction of not knowing until work has already started that you're not going to be able to get access to a certain API or maybe an API doesn't even exist for your developer to build off of. Let's see. I think there's some uh, responses really starting to roll in. And it looks like uh, about 75% feel like you really haven't implemented that strong process yet. So hopefully as we're going through this, it's starting to get the wheels turning of what are those pieces up front that we can standardize and operationalize so that the people that are involved throughout the whole integration development cycle, 
because as we talked about, it does touch so many people, both internally and externally. Do you have the details from all of them to really put in place so that when it does get to your developers, the ones that have such limited time, are they able to hit the ground running and know exactly what they need to do? Or are there still questions that need to be answered that's causing context switching and back and forth that if you had slowed down up front, might have saved you time to, to go faster in the long run. So we'll get into more of that as, as we go through, but that's that's super valuable uh, feedback. And to be honest, that's that's the case that I hear from almost all software companies I talk to. Like I said at the beginning, integrations are treated like an afterthought. And so they become this massive burden because there isn't that really purposeful thought up front on how this is going to work and building these repeatable processes. Because if you build one integration, you're going to get stuck building more. I can, I can almost promise you that. Um, so as we're going through, hopefully those gears are turning on how you can start to operationalize that and utilize something like this template to really make integrations less of a, a bolted on piece, you know, that's an afterthought bolted onto the side of your product and more of a, a true competency where when a new integration comes up or a new requirement is, is um, presented from your customers, it's as simple as, oh yeah, we know exactly how to tackle this. We can, we can turn this around in, you know, maybe a handful of days or weeks rather than the months or even sometimes um, spanning years that I hear so often from these software companies. So let's dig in one layer deeper. So far, we've kind of gathered the main ingredients of the integration, the pieces that we need to start putting together to really produce something that's going to solve these challenges for our customers and meet those business goals that we have. So once we have those raw ingredients, now it's time to define the recipe, right? How, what are the steps that the team needs to take to go out and just execute developing this integration? And this is also a really key part to be able to reference back to once this integration is out in the wild and customers are using it, you might find that there were some pieces that you missed up front that you need to add on to as additional support or functionality. Often it's not one and done with integrations. So having a document that you can point back to that outlines exactly what it was supposed to do for your customers makes the development the next time so much easier for your team. And then it doesn't require that there's that bottleneck of the one developer that built this integration seven months ago uh, is the only person who knows how it works. I think that's something that, you know, feel free to chime in in the chat if that's something you've experienced. But as a developer, I've been there where I build something, I'm the only one who knows how it was built because I was the one developer that was involved with it and I built it without a lot of really strong requirements. There was a lot of back and forth post development of tweaking it to make it work with our, with our customers. And um, it sounds like that is resonating at least with a few people. Um, you know, this is really an attempt to break that bottleneck and make it more accessible, not just to the one developer, but all of the developers in your team. Yeah, Pedro, it, it absolutely is a, a big risk. It it becomes, like Catherine said, a single point of failure where, you know, that developer leaves. Does anybody know how to set this integration up and test it if you need to fix a bug or add some new support to it? So as we go through, you know, those are the things that we're really trying to address. I'm not going to stand here and pretend that gathering requirements and filling out spec documents is the most fun but it is so crucial to really making these work and operationalizing this into a, a core competency at your company. So just kind of double clicking one layer deeper into that idea of functional requirements. This is really where you can start to, to define how the integration is gonna hook into the systems and processes that you've identified as being important. We know customers are in Slack. 
We know that they're engaging with their prospects and users through shared Slack channels. And those tasks that are being created in Acme SaaS are directly related to the conversations that are happening in that Slack. So what are the necessary hooks of getting Slack channels, notifications from Acme SaaS for each of our customers? When should it fire off? Is it a, a scheduled thing that we're going to run every once in a while? Is it something that's going to happen in real time? Are there certain fields or screens that need to be developed either in our app or how is it going to show up in Slack? Are there certain UI elements that need to be targeted? And this is where you can really start to think of the integration, not as a one-off thing that we're solving for a specific customer, but as a productized piece of software that has a pattern to it. It doesn't matter if it's Slack or Teams, the same concepts apply of setting up a notification uh, destination in your app for the different kinds of tasks that should be sent over to that destination, what specific destinations are available, whether it's a Slack channel or Teams workspace, and then how the user should interact with it and the problems it's solving, it's the same. You're just swapping out Teams for Slack for you know, whatever other systems you might need to support in the future. And if you can productize it, not just in the sense that Slack is reusable, but that this messaging notification integration is a reusable piece of functionality that gets your users using your platform more readily, adopting it faster and getting more value out of it, it becomes so much easier to build the next 10 that you might have to support. So going back to our scenario, you know, that's where you can look at uh, starting with the very top of screens and fields. What needs to be updated in your system to make it easy for a user to connect their Slack and pick where those notifications should show up and which notifications they even care about. So in this case, we might need to build a new uh, notification screen within our settings page that's going to have a Slack option for connecting to your Slack workspace and then defining how those uh, notifications are going to be sent. And then once we know, okay, they're going to come from our application, they're going to go to this particular user's Slack channel, how do we know when they should fire? Should we be sending events you know, on a cadence every couple of minutes? Or should we be focusing on really real-time updates? As soon as that task is created in Acme SaaS, the user that it's assigned to should probably get that in real time. There's not really any advantage to waiting every 10 minutes to send a bulk set of messages. There isn't that much data going across and it's so actionable and relevant to the user that real time is, is so important. And once you've identified that, you know where it's going to go, you know when you're going to send it, it really is just defining how is that data going to flow? How is it going to show up in the Slack channel? Is it going to be uh, a notification with buttons that the user can respond to? Or is it going to just be text-based? Is there a UI that Slack provides that you should be utilizing to create that notification? And what sort of tools did the, the developer need to be able to implement that? From there, it becomes sort of an exercise of taking what we've defined as really the art of the possible, what we know is accomplishable, and putting the uh, technical validation in place. This is where you bring in your tech team to identify any of those risks and really give you that internal check that this actually makes sense and that it's something that we could technically accomplish. We know that Slack supports notifications. We know our customers are there. We know they're going to need to send those notifications. What are those technical limitations that you might not be thinking of that your technical team is absolutely thinking of. 
because everything is a, a pie in the sky until you know you get your engineers involved and they say, well, that's a great idea, but you know maybe we don't have an API. So how are we supposed to you know query back any of that information to update tasks? Those are things that you need that developer to do a sanity check on and identify those risks or bottlenecks that could derail this project by the time you actually put someone on doing the work. And so, you know, again, just diving back into the uh, notifications to Slack requirements, we know that there needs to be an API for those tasks within Acme SaaS. We also know that there needs to be some kind of authentication to our system. Right? If a user is going to make a request from their Slack, how do we handle actually mapping that request back to the user? If they click a button that says, you know, change the status of this Slack, uh, excuse me, change the status of this task in Slack, what validation or authentication is going to happen to my API to say, yep, okay, that was the right user. That's a real request. And then be able to define that for your development team. We don't want users to have to go through and do this authorization flow, both in Slack and Acme SaaS. We have their credentials. Can we, can we inject it on their behalf? And then on the Slack side, what is available to actually authenticate to our users Slack? Are we sending messages as the particular user and impersonating them? Or are we a Slack bot that needs to be added to channels and given certain permissions? These are all of those details that become really important for defining based on what you're trying to solve for the, the technical nuance of what needs to happen for the team and be able to spec out if you can accomplish it and if you can do it within the amount of time that you've set. From there, once you've identified really the, the high level and the the one step deeper of what is this going to do technically? Do the APIs exist? Are the, the details that our team needs available? Then it's a matter of saying, okay, we have Slack figured out. We have our app figured out. How do they meet in the middle? And that's where data mapping and uh, field mapping becomes a real challenge. And Chime in in chat if, if you've experienced any pain with uh, mapping fields between your system and your customer's system. I mentioned Salesforce earlier. That's one of the canonical examples that we hear about where you build a Salesforce integration and it works for one customer, but then the second customer comes on board and says, hey, that's great, except we have this one field, this custom field in our Salesforce that drives so much of our business process so unless you can support that in your integration, it's just not going to work for us. It doesn't fit our workflow. Those are the things that it's really difficult for your developer to identify as they're going through the work. So as much of that that you can figure out up front and treat it as that productized thing is, again, really crucial to making this work. Yeah, and there's, there's absolutely... Um, challenges with actually mapping of data types and you know maybe you need to transform something um, you know it's easy to think about a field to a field but what happens when you have mapping of relationships or even something like uh, country codes maybe in one system you have us as your country code for the united states and in a uh, system you're integrating with it's usa Someone needs to be able to say U.S. maps to U.S.A. so that when your integration runs, it knows in both systems it's using the same type of data. Going back to that idea of, you know, how do you do this without constraining your developer resources? This is a huge challenge. And it's one that your developers are so far from. They understand what it means to take a, a string and map it to, um, you know, an integer or uh, convert between different date times, but they might not understand the nuances between different country codes in these systems and why that's important. So giving your subject matter experts a way to be involved with this process, whether it's identifying them up front, which you should almost always do, 
but then also putting tools in place to enable other members of your team that aren't those developers to take on some of this ownership. When I was a developer and I would build out an integration that would map fields between systems, by the time it finally got to a customer, it might be three or four months before it gets in their hands and APIs change, documents change, schemas change, and people aren't always the best at communicating that, especially if it's across company boundaries. So I would develop it with these certain fields in place. And if we ever needed to change it, that was a bug ticket or a, a feature request that would get put on the roadmap and prioritized. A developer would go in, set this up to test and go through all of that process just to validate that that one field that they remapped is, is working. It's a huge feedback cycle that adds a lot of friction when it could be as simple as giving your team tools to do the mapping for the customers while they're on the phone and, and get you know, your developer out of the loop, not need that requirement of a developer always being involved. So as you're thinking through these functional requirements and technical requirements, keep in mind it is that idea of productizing integrations and developing a strategy around how you can efficiently scale these across your org. Your developers have to be a part of it. That's almost a, a guarantee. But how much they have to be involved varies wildly from software company to software company, depending on how they've implemented their uh, integration strategy. So I, I absolutely challenge you to think about what are the areas that other team members that are closer to the customers can start to take on more and more of that. And this is one of those areas that I always um, immediately reach towards as getting your developers out of the loop and putting the people that understand your customers and their specific challenges in front of them first. Or maybe it's even getting that information in front of your customers so that they have this consistent experience of how they can remap those fields. Maybe a customer decides this one field in their sales force is now going to be a major part of their business process. Wouldn't it be great if they could go in, log into your application, remap that field without ever having to even involve anyone from your team? The more you can productize this and build those consistent experiences, both internally and externally, the easier those kinds of changes are where you can quit making your developers the bottleneck and start to get it in the hands of other people. Yeah, so that there's a, a comment here using industry interoperability standards from the start to handle the bulk and then user defined fields uh, for the rest of it. And I, th I think that's such a good example of, especially when there are those industry standards. Not all industries have them, but if you're lucky to have them, it, it makes that definition easier for the initial. And then for all of the additional pieces, that's just added value that you're providing to your customers to get them using your tool more. So for this particular example, I think we've talked about this already a, a fair amount, but really the only mapping we're doing here is mapping a notification destination in Acme SaaS to, in this case, a Slack channel. But that could also be a Microsoft Teams space, or it could be even a, um, text message, maybe it's a phone number that you're going to send these notifications to, but thinking of it in that productized way where it's going to scale, not just for Slack, but for any of your notification-based integrations, again, is, is going to make the next few so much easier to plan and develop around. And it gives your team and your customers that really consistent experience. And I guess that's a good segue into focusing in on the customer experience. If our customers didn't care about integrations, we wouldn't build them. It is 100% in an effort to enable our customers faster, get them more value quickly, and get them so stuck into using your product that they'll never want to leave. But that means you have to have a really good customer experience with these integrations. And as we've started to kind of talk about this a little bit, um, around the, the technical requirements of 
the field mappings and, and how you're going to surface those to your customers. I've got another poll here that I'd love to, to get your thoughts on of how much time does your team spend actually deploying these integrations or, or setting them up for your customers, doing the field mappings, going back and forth on restarting services and um, getting that integration live for your customers. Are you spending any time with it or are you spending a ton of time? I think we see a, an array of, of different uh, responses from customers of either they've gone down the route of making it completely self-serviceable for their customers or minimal touch points for their team to be able to set up some of you know the things like those field mappings. And it, it looks like uh, we're getting a few responses now. A fair amount are not sure how much time you're spending actually deploying these integrations. Fair amount of two to four hours, fair amount in the 10 plus hours. And I think what we see, uh, what I've experienced personally is a huge part of it depends on your customers. Are they super technical and really masters of the, the business processes that they're involved in? Something like maybe uh, ERP systems, they get pretty complex in uh, the different processes that go from taking a purchase order and um, all of the, the billing and invoicing that happens. And if you need to integrate with one of those systems, do your customers have the technical abilities to be able to say, well, I understand how invoices works in NetSuite. I understand how it works in your system. I can line up the pieces myself, or is that something that's a value add of your team coming in, configuring that setup so your users don't have to? It could also be that maybe you're providing teams uh, access to, you know, like the Acme SaaS example, um, just task notifications. And the only thing you want them to be able to set up is what channel should it go to? Integrations range in complexity and your end users are really going to dictate how much they can take on in that deployment process. But by putting more and more of those tools in your customers' hands, you'll start to really um, enable them to quickly get value out of your system, start bringing their data in, start implementing your tool in their workflow without you ever even having to pick up the phone. Faster onboarding, faster time to value. Um, and even if there is still some complexity your team needs to handle, do your developers need to be involved in it? Or are there ways that you can enable other members of that team? Really putting some thought into how much you can put in customers' hands, how much you can put in other members of your team's hands outside of development makes it really, really a, a key part of the scaling. Because when you're dealing with you know, a handful of customers, it's easy enough to pull your developer in. Maybe you've got one or two integrations you're supporting. But what happens on your 100th integration or your 1,000th? One of the things that really crushed my team uh, when we were building so many of these was it was just painful, always getting pulled back into these integrations for things that I thought weren't really things that only the development team could do. So how much of that can you operationalize across your team? And as you're thinking about it, you know, in this example, that Slack one, I think, is a, a great example of showing that idea of providing self-serve. Let an admin of, you know, your customers Slack log into your tool and say, I want to connect our Slack organization. They'll install the, the Acme SaaS bot and they'll configure the notifications where these should show up and, and how it's going to um, interact with your users rather than you having to be the gatekeeper or even worse, having your developers be the ones that have to go set it up. More and more self-service just reduces that friction and it drives a better customer experience. Nobody wants to wait a couple of months to get an integration turned on. If they can do it, let them. So we touched on this as well a little bit, right? That idea of how much of it should be in your customer's hands versus 
uh, how much of it is something that your team should be doing. Or maybe there's a mixture of both. Those are all key pieces to enable your teams and enable your customers, but you have to put some real thought into it up front. If you build Slack and decide halfway through that you want it to be self-serviceable, is the next integration you build, the Teams integration, is it going to have the same UI, UX? Are your customers going to be able to set it up just as simply? Will your development team be able to maintain it in the same way? Is it deployed the same way? Is it built the same way? Or is it still treated as a one-off thing that's just bolted onto the side and something that you want to get done as fast as possible? And you know that's where, again, so much of the strategy isn't just about we need to build an integration in some amount of time. It's how does this fit into your customer's world? And how much value are they getting out of it? And how can you do it without burying that dev team? One of the last areas I, I want to touch on here too is how many of you are thinking about integrations as something that can be monetized or something that can drive customers to um, moving up in your pricing tiers. Are any of these integrations completely gated off from certain uh, customers? Maybe you have a, a free plan where they get basic Slack integrations, but the really powerful ones that drive so much value, that's in your, your mid-tier plan, so they would need to upgrade to it. Or even certain functionality in an integration. Maybe you want to give some customers that are, are willing to pay more real-time integrations where it is happening instantly and they're able to interact with those notifications or maybe your free tier plans, they get them every 15 minutes. Um, these, are, these are really key things that you know, your, your sales team is going to care about, your customer, uh, excuse me, your product team is going to care about. How do we drive adoption? How do we collect more value from our customers? And how do we justify the time and energy in these integrations? Great to hear that uh, some of you are already thinking about exactly this type of, of thing. And it's, it's one that as you start to shift your mindset away from that idea of integrations being a necessary evil, you can start to think of it as how do we get our customers more excited about our product, more value out of it, using it more, talking about it more, and integrations are so much of the heart of that. So for this one, in our scenario, we're going to make the Slack integration available for all. We're trying to ad drive adoption. Once people have adopted it, that's where we can start to put in more of those um, differentiators and value adds. But we want it to be available for everyone so that they can just get excited about it. So think through that as we're... Um, as we're kind of wrapping up here, think through what is your company's strategy? How are you delivering integrations to your customers? What problems are they solving? And how are you driving that demand? Starting to think about these integrations as a way to keep customers, get more customers, inject more value, extend the functionality of your product. Those are the things that you should be thinking about beyond just how do we get this thing done as soon as possible? So let's see here. Um, I think, you know, we are here at time, so I'll, I'll just kind of wrap it up with a few key takeaways. And then um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to, to shoot some over um, either in the chat Q and A, or I'm happy to also answer uh, via email follow-up, but really think about how you could utilize something like this template to define a strategy of streamlining the planning and development of your integrations, make sure you're building the right thing for your customers and something that scales with your team and the needs of your customers. Once you've gotten there, you know, feel free to go through this spec. Maybe take a, take a try at building this out for something like Microsoft Teams and start to shift from just being reactive to your customers and their requirements and thinking more proactively about what are the common things that would drive more adoption, speed up the value that our customers are getting from our platform, any of those types of things. And then 
I will check out the Q and A. It looks like uh, there's a few that have been been answered or excuse me, dropped in here. Um, so just reading through quick. Who should be the one doing the the technical feasibility? A project manager or a technical team member? I think that really boils down to you know your organization and the people that are involved. Um, if it's a small team, maybe it is just you know your your head developer or senior developer and the product manager that's that's identifying this as a problem or understanding from your customers what that challenge is. I think the key though is get someone who understands your customer and their business needs alongside someone who understands the feasibility of what can be done in your platform. So looking through, there's there's just one more here. Um, it looks like based on my experience, you know, how do you handle scenarios where your product team asks you to integrate with a system in a language where uh, they know they need this now, but you're going to have to build on it in the future. So you have to make some of those trade-offs up front. And how do you make those decisions from a technical perspective? And then from there, follow up, how do you and how would you encourage others in the teams to think about situations where product management changes the goalposts based on new information? Craig, I think that's a, a really great question. Um, so from the dev side, there's always going to be trade-offs, but the more that you can put in up front of building a technical framework of integrations, having these concepts of um, configurability, having the concept of um, reusability of these integrations in a consistent way that your team's developing it from the actual technology side, that makes it so much easier for those additional developments over time. As you add additional requirements, you know, it becomes as simple as, well, let's let's add a feature to this the same way you'd add a new feature to your product because you've developed in a framework. Um, and, you know, that's a that's a lift for your development team up front uh, to define that and define it well. But it serves so much in the long run from maintainability, initial development, long term support, any kind of those changes that you might need to make. And then to your question about encouraging others to think about where um, the goalposts might change, that is always going to be the case with things like integrations. It's that messy middle ground in, in between these systems. So the goalposts will shift. It just means that you have to have a really solid way of reacting to that and a centralized strategy around handling those changes. And that might mean punting on certain things until you know the initial development's complete. But if you have that framework to operate within, those changes become much easier to orchestrate across the teams, plan around, and still deliver a product or a, an integration that is solving the initial goal, while maybe you know some additional feature functionality coming down the pipe. And get your teams thinking about the bigger picture of how this impacts not just you know their piece of the puzzle, but Sales cares so much about this and we care about sales caring about it because that's that's what's driving our revenue. That's what's you know moving us up in our market and our, our customers care about it. And as product leaders, we should care so much about our customers experience and how they're onboarding, how quickly they're getting value from our tool. So really thinking about it, not just in how it impacts your area of the business, but also the greater team as a whole, because integrations really do span an entire organization. Well, I appreciate everybody sticking on for uh, a couple more minutes and uh, happy to answer any other questions. I think Laura uh, mentioned that, you know, there's my email in the chat, reach out to me on LinkedIn. We'd love to connect in the future and um, hopefully you, you found a lot of value out of this. Thanks.